Hi, everybody. My name is Anna Droll. I'm here at South Florida Theological Seminary. We're here to discuss, uh, along with Dr. Esa Autero, here to my left, and Dr. Eric Sarwar, the theme of theological education. I'm division chair for ministry here at the seminary, and Dr. Autero, uh, who will be speaking as well, is dean of the seminary. And we have had Eric Sarwar here as a guest for the past few days, and it has been invigorating. Uh, we're going to be discussing right now the topic of theological education and theological educators, the work of building educators across uh, not only uh, denominational lines, but cultural lines, and expanding the theological table to include um, many voices in the theological discussion, in biblical perspectives, understanding of, the, of scripture, various readings of the scripture, and so forth. So I'm going to go ahead and, and first of all, allow Dr. Altero to, to, to speak into the subject right now. I think it's wonderful to have also Dr. Eric Sarvar here with us, along with Dr. Anna, as we're discussing this very important topic of theological education and theological educators, not only North America and Europe, but also around the world in Global South. And uh, basically, as we know, theological education has expanded from being a Northern a European and American enterprise to encompass the whole globe. And I think we are all passionate about global education, uh, global theological education, and how we can best contextualize uh, reading of scripture, uh, theologizing, and preparing men and women for ministry. So I think that's what we're all passionate about. And we want to do uh, that with vigor as well as we can, and obviously all for the glory of God. Uh, we have our guest, uh, also, Dr. Eric Sarvar, from, originally from Pakistan and now uh, currently serving in Southern California. So perhaps, uh, uh, Dr. Eric, could you give us a little bit of uh, background maybe about yourself and also how are you involved in theological education? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Esa and Dr. Anna. And uh, it's been a pleasure for me. And being a churchman, and especially from engaging from in, with the theological education, not only in Pakistan from the last 20 years, but now from past eight years in a global context, especially being a fuller as a crossroad of a global uh, uh, theological educators and missiologists, not only. And here in Southern uh, uh, Florida, it is also a pleasure. And I have seen um, uh, here lots of international uh, uh, crossroad of uh, theological students, those who are becoming here. Well, first of all, uh, I would like to comment and start that currently there is a cry uh, from uh, theological educators and theological administrators around the world. How can we decolonize theological education? As you mentioned earlier in your comment, uh, that theological education uh, has been a part of, or the we can say that the crown of the Western academics and the Western mission enterprises, yeah. and mm -hmm. that reached to the non-Western global South with the baggage. Mm -hmm. And that baggage was uh, a Western uh, critical thinking, analytical thinking, however, with a hierarchy of certain, certain disciplines, and that gone across the world. But now, as we all aware that uh, colonial powers and the, uh, and the post-colonial era and, and because of the shifting paradigms of the centrifugal of missions in the Western world, now there is a demand and a need for both having a global voices in a theological thinking. So that's very important uh, for us to discuss that because you are engaging lots of theological educators and, and students. Myself, coming from Global South, being a part of the mainstream uh, uh, kind of uh, educators and education. Uh, so uh, we have been observed few things which we need, that, which we I observe that they need to address immediately, not only by the uh, Western, uh, Western education, educator or theological thinkers, but mm -hmm. also how it could be funnelized to the mm -hmm. global south. So, Eric, when you're talking about decolonizing, uh, would that be synonymous with decentering? So, decentering the theologies of the of the of the 
west or the north, we may say, and 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 expanding the theological table. Is is that what you're what you're um, yes? Actually, at? there are various dimensions involved. Uh, when we say theological education, we are talking about various a whole enterprise, and which is very deep actually. Uh, first of all, let me give this uh, theological premise uh, for the theological education. We all know that uh, theological education was the heart of the Bible since from Old Testament Moses until New Testament in the Paul. We know that the first theological local school started by Paul in uh, Ephesus mm -hmm. when he rented a place. And that's where the, he started for two years. He was teaching over there. That's where the concept came, a local theological academy. And that's reach out to the across the world. And then Reformation, because we are talking about reform tradition and Western. So Reformation, we see that uh, Reformation was not only, uh, we know only big names like uh, uh, John Calvin or Luther. Uh, but however, there was a whole team of uh, uh, reformers. Like John Knox, he was an immigrant student in Calvin's Academy in Geneva. When he went back to Scotland, that's where the Presbyterian started, <laughs> okay? And the academy started. That's from where the Cambridge and Oxford, the Puritans were there. And they were starting academies all there. And that's how they said, Pittsburgh started here. And then the Princeton started here with the Presbyterians. All this history of the theological school education go back to biblical to our current. And that's, uh, that's how it reached to my country. It reached to Africa. It reached to uh, as a part of the colonial theological education also. Mm -hmm. So there are certain challenges actually, which I see in my context, and also probably you might have seen. Uh, I would like to address through this conversation also to the international or Western donors, those who partner theological education and support theological education in Global South. First of all, the biggest challenge which I have seen and which I was in a conversation with a few of my professors in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. They are full-time professors. Even, even one is a principal of, a, mm -hmm. uh, of one local theological seminary. And they lament that 80%, 70 to 80% of international donors and donations go to the maintaining the structure, infrastructure, buildings, bills, and everything, rather than paying on the uplifting or the quality of the theological education. Mm. And when I say theological education, it means, and uh, I'm quoting now again, that even a full-time professor in Pakistan, if I talk in a, in a uh, British pound, or in American dollar, they are receiving around or less than 200, sometimes even less than $300 per month salary, which is nothing. So how can they survive in that? So when, when these all Western players, when you think about the logical education, especially in a global South, you cannot develop or uplift or, uh, or develop a quality of theological education uh, uh, without developing theological educators. And that's come their lifestyle, their living, their expenses, their further education, their research, their grants, and lots of other things. So we're talking not only about bringing theologies together, theologians to the table together, but sustaining theological education outside. Uh, yes, probably you can comment. You both are in yeah. the Western academics. Yeah. So what is, the, what is the situation of theological educators here? Are they in the same uh, waters or do they have some better lifestyle? Yeah, and I, I think that depends. There are so many different kinds of educational institutions, including theological and, uh, education. So I interact with the colleagues obviously here at the South Florida Bible College and Theological Seminary, but also in various other colleges, some that are the mega seminar, uh, seminaries, bigger ones, and then some that are uh, professors in very small or perhaps not as prestigious universities. Now, as far as I understand, the trend in the United States is that uh, all of edu higher education, not just theological education, but all of education is becoming more uh, business oriented. Mm. So which means in practice that few administrators are making bigger and bigger salaries and there are less and less full time faculty members and more and more adjunct faculty members that are being paid less and less. Mm. And so efficiency takes precedence over quality of education and, and also having big infrastructures, which becomes top heavy, bureaucratic, and also very expensive. So uh, 
in the biblical higher education, some of this is true as well. So there are a lot of emerging institutions and smaller institutions that are building uh, less uh, heavy infrastructure with the view of lifting up the, the quality of the theological education, or at least that's the goal. Mm. And there, in recent years, there has been, for example, in, in Florida, in around the United States, there's been a number of seminaries that have actually been closed mm. due to not just due to pandemic, but because the increased uh, expenses that are part of the higher education and that whole trend. And I, I do see an alarming trend that is also in some Bible colleges where the educators are being neglected because they are really the heart of every college and seminary is the professors because they're the ones who are the spiritual heart. They're the ones that are the educators. And uh, without them, no seminary or college is able to function. So there, there is that trend here as well, uh, which I'm praying and hoping that would move forward to uh, the direction where, okay, the infrastructure does not need to be uh, expanded and the need for all kinds of extracurricular activities that are not especially spiritual in nature mm -hmm. should not take precedence <coughs> over the actual theological content, the theologizing, even discipleship of the student. So I see that partially uh, or that similar trend here, but it comes from a different angle from the pressure of the market and consumer-oriented uh, cultural paradigm that mm -hmm. we can see here, especially uh, many of the younger students. Now, we, we at the South Florida Bible College are more adult learners, but in many of the institutions that recruit younger students, more sports programs, more adventure, more experiences, which always increases the cost of... Uh, of uh, tuitions and the infrastructure. So, so that is that is a trend that we are seeing in North America, uh, but I think it's more consumer-oriented uh, problem as opposed to what we're seeing in, in the global South. Even mm -hmm. though I think that same, uh, same trend uh, is seen, as far as I've noticed, at least in Latin America, in some parts of uh, other parts of the global South, that there's the same kind of market-driven trend in all of society, which then also is re reflected in some of the higher education and, and sometimes even theological seminaries. Yeah, Dr. Anna, mm -hmm. you have been in Africa for mm -hmm. various times, even your research was there. What's your observation in African context about theological education and educators? Well, I think there's, uh, there are, there's great educators in the African context in West Africa and I think that the institutions are doing the best they can. Many of them are um, energized and, and appear to me to be well-funded by the, the, the denominations that are supporting the institutions. But I, I see, I, I sense an eagerness for, for contact and for interaction um, uh, outside of the African context. Um, at least I, I sense that. I've, I've experienced, um, uh, been at conferences with uh, um, Afri not only West African, but East African theologians, South African theologians overseas. And there's, I think there's a general hunger for, uh, for gathering together at, at a mutual, at a table, a mutual table. And um, it's been a concern for me as well. You know, how do we level out that table? And I'm thinking about um, some of the adaptations that we've had to go through here in the United States due to COVID and, uh, and the changing, changing markets, as you were saying, Esa, the adaptations mm -hmm. into more uh, the virtual world. Mm, yeah. And I think it's been an incredible blessing, really, um, having, ha having to do the virtual Zooming conferences. There's been an aspect of that as, that has really leveled... Uh, the theological and theological engagement I see from from the point of view that that no longer is it necessary to have to fly here or there to gather and to exchange um, um, our theological perspectives and our readings of the scriptures together, but we can do that now virtually, mm. and, and that, I think that's an important part of this whole adaptation piece. Um, but yeah, I think West Africans are. Um, 
uh, are they're robust in their theology. I'm very, very excited to be at the table with them any way that I can. Um, going over overseas to to Africa, I was part of the the Sane Institute, the inauguration and, and yeah. that first conference um, in honor of Laman Sane, and that was very exciting. And got to sit at the table with uh, South African theologians and East African theologians in um, in Basel and uh, in in Germany. There's just this hunger to be together. I think mm -hmm. that's what I'm getting at, yeah. and I feel it myself. And on that note, I think, Essa, would you share with us a little bit about the complexion of our our seminary mm -hmm. here? Yes. Because I'm I'm a fairly I'm a newcomer yeah. really to the yes. seminary, but there's there's just a yeah. diversity here that's very exciting. Sure. And I, let me just touch on the what you mentioned earlier about just right now about the theological table as well. So coming back to what uh, Dr. Eric said also about uh, the funding of the theological institutions and particularly the professors. So uh, what I've seen as a, also as a trend in Latin America, India, and some other places where I've been uh, teaching and visiting, when the professors are not adequately funded, uh, they have to have other jobs. Or they do other things and that limits their time for writing, for reflection, and even engaging in a theological discussion. And so I think that's a big, and now that does influence us here in, in the North as well, because we tend to be very busy with, with all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of things, but, but that is a big, uh, big hindrance to the participation of the theological discussion and coming around the same theological table. And so that also is reflected in a sense that uh, you have some institutions that are well-funded, and then there are more time and more uh, compensation for the educators, whereas then the emerging institutions or other institutions for some other reasons that don't have funding. So then we end up having a lot of adjunct professors or bivocational, as we have in a pastorate as well. It's not always, the, it's not always a bad thing to be bivocational, but if that's the only option, then it limits the the amount of people who can participate in, in the conversation. So I, I think that's, uh, and that also has some colonial heritage in a sense that, well, which uh, institutions and denominations focus on theological education, invest in it, and want to fund some of the institutions, for example, in the global south. So th there are all kinds of uh, interwoven sociopolitical sure. uh, entanglements that I think play into this, this discussion as well. And from our perspective, now at South Florida Bible College, now we're in a sense interesting. I always tend to say to, to people who ask about South Florida Bible College that here in South Florida, we have one foot in America and one foot in the Caribbean and Latin America. We're almost like in that in-between area because we're so diverse uh, demographically, South Florida in general, and also South Florida Bible College and Theological Seminary specifically. Most of our students come from Brazil Latin America and uh, Caribbean islands. And then we have uh, some students from India and Myanmar and from other Asian countries, but we are very, we actually have very few traditionally Caucasian Americans mm -hmm. who, who are actually studying here. And we're interdenominational yeah. as well. Yeah, and, and so we have that ethnic diversity and then we have interdenominational uh, diversity as well. So that also puts a lot of, uh, uh, brings a new spin to our theological education because we cannot really have a traditional curriculum, but we have to take the, the context of the students into very careful consideration in, in our curriculum, and, and that will that will that put some new challenges to us. And, and in addition to that, language, you know, communication and cultural issues that, that we're trying to negotiate as as we as we move along. Concerning your, I would like to add with the, with this notion that how can we decolonize yeah. and how can we bring a contextual voices. Yeah. I would say that from having coming from global south part and because of the Presbyterian seminary yeah. where it was 1877, I was graduate and uh, Gujarat Theological Seminary. However, uh, there are lots of lots of things actually in the overall theological education framework. I have seen and I was propose here uh, or would share like that what's my observation 
And number one, as we are entering into the millennial, we will talk in your class uh, about the uh, education and thinking, mm. theological thinking. I think two things actually we need to do, especially uh, not only here, but also around the world global educational system. Number one, we need to revisit our theological curricula. Mm -hmm. uh, because generally, if you survey, you will find that five top subjects are dominating across the world. Number one, top systematic theology. Number two, biblical theology, Old Testament, New Testament. Number three, church history. Yeah. And then practical theology. And then whatever fit in that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That This is yeah. a general formula yeah. yes. for every seminary. Now, in a post-pandemic, that changed everything. That changed the whole game. Mm -hmm. Because you have to be engaged in the cultural side. You have to be engaging in a doxological side. You have to be engaging in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a worship and a missions, actually. So I would say that three things need to revisit every seminary, not only in North American context, but also in a global context. And also, Eric, the issue of spiritual formation. Yes. That's, Coming to that, the surface uh, in, in terms of the challenges that we've been facing, right? Uh, political challenges. Uh, nationalistic challenges, uh, failures in the academy, mm -hmm. moral yeah. failures in the academy, yes. um, in the in higher education. Uh, so there's been a turn now, at least from my perspective, toward a conversation about discipleship. What is then? We're right in the middle of the class, third millennium discipleship. And you are a special guest, and mm -hmm. and among other speakers. But the idea is, let's let's look now. At what does it mean to be a disciple? In, in light of these challenges. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a trend now towards contextual theology, understanding um, what what's going on in the context and, and um, how can we bring uh, 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 an authentic hmm. biblical mm -hmm. voice and yeah. perspective and to I, those issues. And also, what is the church's role and what is the seminary's role in this discipleship? Because discipleship needs to happen mm -hmm. What happens? What what happens if the the church is lacking or is not doing it? Mm. Is it the seminary's role mm. or are we? Mm. You know that I think that's a that that relationship between the churches and the seminaries is also one crucial issue because in the West they have tended to divide and be they are separate entities, mm. whereas in global South I can see them much more intertwined and connected to each other in in a very positive way. It, yes, I agree with you. And that's why uh, when I see uh, the curricula or the theological education in my cultural context, I propose two things, which is a good starting point. Yeah. Then we can build on that. Yeah. Number one is because my work and my experience as a musician and then as a musical peacemaker and then as a global worship uh, uh, you know, consultant or kind of a, a scholar in this field, I would say that if uh, each seminary in their own cultural context, if they start from the doxological approach, mm -hmm. because doxology will help us to not only navigate, but design contextual cultural worship, ethnodoxology. Mm -hmm. yes. So that will be a one, one program that we need to add. Mm -hmm. And that will open also your worship and music studies, and uh, your doxological approaches, your missiological engagement also. What is the local mission approaches, which also detach theological education from missional enterprise yes. and give them authentic voice in their own cultural mm -hmm. yes. relevancy. And, and so that's also connected to the uh, theology as a reflection. So, so proper theologizing needs to actually emerge from the ground level up and there needs to be a reflection and then articulation of theology. In other words, we could say what God is doing in the community at the grassroots level then is being articulated and theology emerges from that rather than from the abstract like the Western method has generally been. Let's think about it in the abstract, philosophy, and then I'm going to create a theology for you. Yeah. Right, and so theologizing yeah. is not the meta narrative, Correct. but worship is the meta narrative, yeah. yes. and in and in that atmosphere of worship and focus mm -hmm. on how we express that worship, it gets back to spiritual formation, love for God. Yeah. You know, at a concluding point, um, yeah. uh, I would like to share a story. Yes, uh, I was interviewing an uh, Egyptian missiologist two weeks ago. Yes, and um, he told me he was a professor of mission at the uh, Evangelical Theological Seminary in Cairo. And he told me a fascinating story, which I think is still applicable in our cultural context. He told me uh, that uh, uh, during the British colonial era, 
when American mission and church mission society were working together in the Muslim context. So Pakistan and uh, Egypt were under the same mission, CMS and uh, American mission under the same mission bodies. So uh, Raja Dulip Singh, he was the son of Raja Ranjit Singh, who was a ruler in Lahore, Punjab. So when British colonial conquered the Punjab and they offered Raja Ranjit Singh that we will spare your son if you hand it over uh, the government to us and he, we will take him to England. So they took Raja, Raja Dulip Singh to England and from there, Raja Dulip Singh has been invited and was part of the missionary enterprises, and he was invited to Egypt. And because he was a royalty under the British uh, pay scale, so they were introduced him a uh, Egyptian missionary woman, uh, uh, Bamba. Her, her name was Bamba. So, so she married to Dulip Singh in Egypt, and then Raja Dulip Singh has a boat which he was using for his leisure time in the River Nile. Mm -hmm. Not only that one, what he did, when he left Egypt and they were settled down back in England, he donated that boat to the American mission in Egypt. And can you believe that? Recent current theological seminary, evangelical theological seminary, Cairo, was started in that boat as a mobile theological education school. Oh, wow. So that was an interesting link. I see that how the Pakistan's Raja Rajit Dalip Singh yes. <laughs> went married to Bamba in Egypt and then how the mission work supported by the, on a boat going from village to village around the River Nile. And that's how they started. I think today we also need to expand theological yes. education, not only from the institutional pool, but also a mobile mentorship yes. and a mobile yes. theology. Yes through small pockets, mm -hmm. through, like we are using this, this platform, yes. internet or, or virtual or, or like, um, uh, like a mobile, because theology is a work of a community, not only theologians. Yes. That is a fascinating paradigm, the mobile yeah. Yeah. theological. Yeah. When I was a girl, we had the mobile library. It was a bus that went yeah. up the hill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we were in a kind of in a remote neighborhood and the library in, in a bus would come to us. So. Wow, develop that a little bit more. Help me to visualize it. How did that work? <laughs> well, I, I think if you look at even Paul, when he went, like you were alluding to, the when he was in the academy yeah. in Ephesus, I mean, that was the grassroots level of theological education. Yes. And in that context, I mean, spending two years in one location wasn't the end of it. Yeah. But then he went other places, and obviously he had his own disciples and specific letters to Timothy and Titus, yes. yeah. Yeah. Were, which are kind of like the theological practical theolo theology treatises for them, yes. which obviously we have as well. Uh, so I think there's a lot to then uh, imagine and envision what it would look like today. And I think internet certainly is one of them. Yes. Uh, and because it, it goes beyond the confines of the local church, yeah. but then should and hopefully would also engage the local church and local context. But, but it's not just one sermon or one teaching, but it is, it is more expanded. Yes. And what's equally beautiful is, is the missional element, right? Yes. Of um, the theological endeavor then is, is missional and, and, and that pushes against an insular, the insular theological institution, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the, theologizing on the way and- uh, yeah. It is, the, yes, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Sarwar, thank you for being with us. Thank yes. you very much. Thanks, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.